Today is Thursday, so we talk about success for Scrum Masters. We've been sharing success stories here on the podcast since 2015, so there's a lot to learn. But uh, wouldn't you like to learn from people with decades of experience? Well, don't worry, we've got you covered. The Scrum Master Toolbox podcast launched Tips from the Trenches, the Scrum Master Edition audiobook. That's version 2 now out. There are 13 audio interviews, 3 hours of audio with Scrum Masters that have decades of experience. We've got Mike Cohn, Linda Rising, Lisa Crispin, Christopher Avery, Emily Weber, myself, your podcast host, Yves Hanul, the editor of the original Tips from the Trenches ebook, also available with the audiobook. Altogether, 13 super experienced Scrum Masters. To learn more, visit bit.ly forward slash audio tips 2. That's bit.ly forward slash a u d i o t i p s and the numeral 2 at the end, all lowercase, all one word. So, one more time, that's bit.ly forward slash audio tips 2 to learn more. And now, on to today's show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Success and Retrospective Thursday. And we have with us this week, Lawrence Bonema. Hi, Lawrence. Welcome back. Hi, Vasco. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. So, Lawrence, on Thursdays, we talk success. But first, what's your favorite retrospective format and why? My favorite retrospective format is the timeline, as described by Esther Derby and Dinah Larson in their book, Agile retrospectives, making good teams great. I think it's simple, it's versatile, it's not too gimmicky, um, and it's a nice way to structure the conversation along the five steps that they outline. So I can go a lot of ways with it. So we describe the timeline or visualize it or really do it with sticky notes, uh, all kinds of different ways to host that. And in the end, you really get a nice overview of this is what happened, this is what we think about it, this is what we we're looking to improve based on the discussion we had around this. And this is the plan. Yeah, absolutely. The timeline is also a very good visualization strategy to identify potentially hiding problems. Indeed. And, and what I like most about it even is when you add a positive negative aspect to it, as dangerous as that can be, because people tend to be overly concerned with the negative and underly concerned with the positive but by making the top and bottom of the timeline also mean this was awesome or this was horrible then usually there's at least one or two events that somebody puts up there that someone thinks are awesome while someone else on the same team thinks they were horrible and those are wonderful conversations like waiting to happen uh, because often people don't even realize that so yeah, that that person left was the happiest moment of one team member and the saddest of another. And then just discussing that already makes the team better, let alone if you then develop a plan to make that better going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this also reminds me of one of the great tips about facilitation is that if we find some way to visualize what is being discussed, we can actually generate more insights, but also find those uh, lack of alignment topics that we need to work on. Yes, it's one of the reasons that I taught myself graphic facilitation, because uh, the other reason being that I, I just have a kick doing it, right? So it's also just fun. But to really become good at graphically facilitating sessions like that and then creating a drawing of the timeline with the team, that is uh, truly amazing. A lot of people uh, get a total kick out of it, uh, including me as a facilitator. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, now we turn our attention to success. And of course, the primary reason why we go back to retrospective so often so that we can help the team succeed and of course, have ourselves a successful impact on their work. So Lawrence, share with us, what's your definition of success for a Scrum Master? Well, the prime directive by Norm Kurth uh, actually states, regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. Now, you can imagine the essence of that. Everybody here did the best they could. That was what I essentially always zoom in on. 
And I, th I think that's really important that people realize that, that almost no one is on a team there to, to not do a good job. And when you discuss things uh, together, having that as your base assumption makes almost every conversation better because people feel uh, – people can really feel it when you're essentially starting from a position of blaming each other or if you're starting from a position of, ah, it's really bad that this happened. Let's figure out how to not do that again. For me, the Prime Directive is also an important reminder that we should look for improvement in – uh, either the circumstances, the information available, the processes, uh, whatever there might be that is not the people, right? And very often we think, oh, we, if I could just change Jeff into a much more agreeable person, and we forget that maybe Jeff is not agreeable because he's under a lot of pressure from the, you know, either the timeline or some problem at home or whatever. And unless we address the pressure, no matter how much time we spend trying to, quote unquote, change Jeff, it's never going to happen. Yeah, actually, that's uh, nice, it's nice for you to say that, because I think that is the uh, the the forgotten part of a safe environment where it also should be safe to be you. Right. So and sometimes people are a little bit abrasive. Sometimes people aren't very socially adept. And it, it, of course, it's good if they learn how to be more socially adept. But it may be reasonable to think, oh, let's let's all pitch in a little. Right. So let's accept a little bit of social awkwardness in exchange for seeing the other also try and and then make it safe for people just to be themselves, whatever that may be. I think that's a, a, a great addition to this discussion. I, I remember once working with a developer, a, a team, and there was this developer in the team that people looked at, uh, looked at a bit awkwardly, and they weren't sure that this developer was kind of, you know, all in. Uh, there was some pull requests that weren't made, some code reviews that weren't accepted, like, you know, that kind of thing that very often happens between programmers anyway. But this particular developer was just, as you said, perhaps not so socially adept as others and, and had this very abrasive way of communicating that. Turns out when we changed the goals of the team for developing something that actually all of them believed in and all of them wanted to work on, this developer shined and became the most productive developer in the team. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I can immediately think of two or three examples of the same thing happening just by making room for somebody's personality without making excuses for it. Right. So it's still good to give them feedback like, dude, you're a bit of an asshole there. Um, so couldn't you just tone it down a little? Uh, feedback can be pretty harsh and direct, especially people that have abrasive personalities actually usually kind of appreciate that. But still, you can accept that, of course, from where they're coming from. It's probably not realistic to think that there's a personality change overnight. Or even ever. Yeah, exactly. And actually, if there is, that may be the moment to really sit them down and say, what's happening? <laughs> because something must have happened. So I, I'm reminded of the uh, sports analogy. And uh, we've all heard, you know, whatever the sport is, basketball, football, soccer, baseball, whatever. Whatever the sport is, uh, if it's a team sport, we all know stories of certain team players that weren't really the best team players. And then suddenly they change teams and in another team they started to perform massively better. And that, the, you know, the context changed, but the person didn't, right? You, it, it's unreasonable to expect that when, a, a, let's say, a football player moves from one team to the other, that they would suddenly become a different person but their performance can drastically transform. And, and that's just one very illustrative example of how the context affects the people, no matter what their personality is. Yeah, yeah, horribly in my experience, that actually is mostly due to differences in leadership. So what I, what I assume or what I think could probably be true with uh, the, the sports teams that you describe is that the coach that is working with those teams has a different style that is really conducive to making this type of, of player work well with others. Uh, and that is actually, it's, it's of course, it always is from two ends, right? So it is the combination of the coach and the personality of the player. And I think the same thing holds true with the, the, the personality of the scrum master and the, the, the base personality of most people on the team. 
if that doesn't really gel, um, the Scrum Master will have a really hard time making it a high performance team uh, or helping them become one. Uh, and and just a change of Scrum Master can do wonders for that team. And that's not to diss the Scrum Master that's being exchanged, right? So sometimes it's just better to have a different style of leadership for a, a given style of team. And I think that's actually something we underutilize. We, we tend to think we need to be able to do it all. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that, Lawrence. You're welcome, Vasco. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so. Tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.